damping now damping is um, how much it slows down well, damping causes things to slow down so when we for example when we oscillate the cantilever we spring the cantilever it's bouncing up and down but it doesn't do that forever it slows down it might go for 10 or 20 seconds <clears throat> until it's um, virtually stopped and um, damping is often done deliberately for example shock absorbers in a car um, have that job exactly because without shock absorbers if you're going on a bumpy road the car would be bouncing and, and sometimes it would be bouncing increasingly you go higher and higher and higher until you just about jump out of the car so <clears throat> shock absorbers in the car help the um, car to reduce damping and also leaf springs do the same they they have a damping uh, inherent in the spring because of the friction between the leaves and that helps to reduce the bounciness that's why <clears throat> you can get away with a box trailer with no um, shock absorbers of course if your box trailer had coil springs it'd be a different story because coil springs are uh, very very low friction compared to leaf springs all right now damping is uh, very important when you have something happening at the natural frequency so the natural frequency means that as you apply a force you're applying at just the right time to increase um, the um, the oscillation so when that happens your your oscillations are going to increase they're going to get bigger and bigger and we've got a graph down here which is going to be referring to uh, all the way through this topic which is this graph here and uh, well, i'll explain this a couple of times but <clears throat> basically um the frequency well, the natural frequency is omega n. Well, really, that's uh, radians per second, but it's the same thing. So if you're applying a frequency of exactly the natural frequency, then your frequency ratio will be 1. So let's say the natural frequency was 10 hertz, and you're applying a force that's also at 10 hertz. Then what will happen is the beam will increase. So as you do... Um, as you apply one apply the force at just the right time every time the beam goes up and down it's going to get a little bit bigger and that will continue to happen until it completely falls apart um, because technically it could go on uh, infinitely big which can't happen so it'll break but so if you had no damping so if your zeta which is this little curly thing if that was zero then the spike the curve of of this would just go right up indefinitely so we'd have a uh, infinite amplification so this would just go up forever uh, to infinity if uh, if zeta was so you can I draw zeta I don't know. Um, if that was equal to zero then <coughs> you have infinite amplitude now how do we read this amplitude what it says what's 10 to the north that's one right so what it actually means is if you had we would just talk with cantilever if you had a cantilever with enough force to cause let's say one millimeter of deflection all right so let's say it's uh, just one newton or something and when you put one newton on it it deflects one millimeter say here's the wall So that would be like me putting at zero frequency. That would be this point here. So when you're at zero frequency, the amount of amplitude change is one. So the one millimeter will become one millimeter. If that if that was a different weight that made 17 millimeters, then the one would be 17. So you just scale the graph according to what the default static deflection is so this is a graph for everything and you put your you scale the graph to put your numbers in so that's zero frequency what's zero frequency mean that means it's static you just put a load on it and measure the deflection static now <clears throat> if we put very very high frequencies on like let's say twice the uh, if we put twice the natural frequency on so we put this on and off really quickly twice as quickly as the natural frequency of the bridge of, of the cantilever 
then it actually reduces the amount of deflection. It's actually less. Because as you're pushing down, the, the beam was already trying to come up and you're pushing against it. So it ends up being less deflection, which is surprising. So here, if we had, um, let's say we had this, this curve here, we might have only this much deflection, which is only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are log graphs, so one, two, so that's only about 20% of, let's say, the 17 mil. So there's only a couple of millimeters of deflection. Now, the reason we have a set of curves is depending on the amount of damping. So this first one here, we have 1.5, that's very high damping. And the very low one here is 0.01, that's got very little damping in it. So we probably have a fairly low damping situation. So let's say we were 0.05 when we calculate our number. Let's say that was out, that was us, right? So maybe, just having a guess. What would happen when we uh, we apply a load? So if we were to apply a force here on the end of the cantilever, that was equivalent to let's say three millimeters worth of deflection. All right. So we apply a force here. Let's say it's three newtons. So making these numbers up. When we apply three newtons statically, we get three millimeters. So this point here would be worth three millimeters. Now. If that's three millimeters, then we multiply by the amplification of the of this graph. So we count these lines and see how many times. Now this 0.05 actually gives all the way up to 10. 10 to the one is 10. So that means with a damping ratio of 0.05, when you're running at resonant frequency, the natural frequency of the cantilever, then the amount of um, amplitude is going to be times 10. So it has a magnification of 10 if you're running at natural frequency. If you're running at double the natural frequency, you're quite safe. It's way down. It's not doing much at all. So it's very sensitive depending on uh, whether you're close to the natural frequency or not. So that's how we read this chart. We, we need to find out what the damping ratio is, work out which curve that you should be looking at. Uh, you can tell if the damping ratio is about 0.6 or higher, then it looks like we don't have a problem with, um, see this one doesn't even have a problem at the um, critical frequency or the uh, natural frequency. It's not even a problem. It doesn't, it doesn't shake itself to pieces because the damping ratio is high enough to absorb that, stop that from happening. <clears throat> this is my screen's phrase. I can see my, I can see my mouse moving. Well, it seems to be working. You got to be looking at the at the graph. Little tiny things happening on the graph. <clears throat> So if I was just to draw the graph for um, a zeta of 0.05, I've got this. And the top of that is 10 times whatever the deflection is at static. So they're the two things we're comparing. We're comparing static, which means no vibration, with the natural frequency. Don't ask me why it's delaying so much. <clears throat> and if the static um, deflection was three millimeters, say, then when we're going at natural frequency, then the deflection will be 30 millimeters. If our um, if our damping is um, 0.05. All right, so that's basically the um, the idea of where we're going to. But the only thing we have to do now is we need to know how to get that number. How do we get that number? So let's go back to the, uh, <clears throat> the notes here. 
All right, now, there's two things going on. There's the damping decrement and the damping ratio. The damping ratio, which is that zeta, is the one we're looking at. So, so that graph are damping ratios. So this zeta thing is what we call damping ratio. Now, the damping ratio uh, is sort of a little bit tricky to work out. Got a couple of formulas here we have to run through. Um, uh, but we can work it out from how, how much it changes between two oscillations. So we did a video of the, um, of the vibrating beam. And the, beam, the video was at 120 frames per second, I think. Uh, you can you can that image you can um, you can measure yourself. Oh here we go. Oh, that was two forty. Oh I think it comes from this one. So two four well we can look it out. If it's going ten hertz isn't it around 10 hertz? So if it's 10 hertz and we've got 30 frames, frame is 61, 41, so it's doing 20. So we've got 20 frames. I'm trying to work out how much um, time in between, not that we really need to know that, but um, just to get, a, get an idea of what the video was. In 20 frames, uh, and it's doing 10 hertz, so it does a 10 hertz, so around 200 frames per second. Because the 20, 20 frames is one oscillation, and it does 10 of those a second, <coughs> so it's about 200 hertz. Yeah, 200 frames per second. So maybe it is the two forty. All right, um, it won't affect it though because time's not a factor. It's the uh, it's the difference in amplitude between two successive cycles. So it look, looks like a um, sine wave, like this graph up here. Here's it. This one. So it's one of these sine waves, <clears throat> and if you had no damping and had the black one, that's damping ratio zero. All right, just keeps going forever. And if we have damping ratio 0 0.1, then it slows down. You can see it's slowing down. Uh, that's the green one. So it's slowing down. By the time it's done one cycle, that's the end of your first cycle here. You you now lost about 75% of your um, amplitude. In the second cycle, you've lost 75% of 75%, etc. So it's just keeping on uh, reducing by that amount. So we have probably not. It's probably not as high as 0 0.1. Um, but if we can see how much amplitude we have the first one and compare how much amplitude we have in the second one and we compare these two well technically we should measure those from the middle somewhere because that's the amplitude So this is the uh, number two. Right, this is number one, that's number two. So we're just seeing uh, what's the proportion of number two compared to number one. And let's say it's 70%. Then from that, we can work out uh, where damping ratio is. That's what we're doing. Okay, back to the question. We have uh, some numbers there. We've got 103 for the first oscillation and 100.6 for the second oscillation. So that's two consecutive oscillations. And uh, we have a decrement, damping decrement. That's the first one we're going to work out. What is a damping decrement? 
and that's the log of x1 over x2. So we're basically just going to tell n, or the base e, of x1, which is our um, <clears throat> peak at the start of two consecutive so So x1 is the start, and x2 is the second one. So x1 is the first one, which was 103. And x2 is the 100.6. And that gives us a decrement curve. Two, three, four, seven, ten. Yeah, there. So that's our decrement. Which is Greek letter delta, lowercase delta. <coughs> and now we put that number into this other equation to get our damping ratio, which is zeta, which is that fancy Greek letter, which is kind of hard to draw. And we put that number uh, into this one. So, that's the top, divided by the square root of 2 pi squared, plus that funny number again. That number divided by bracket two times pi which bracket squared plus that thing squared plus bracket um, square root equals double three seven five two okay now that's a pretty small number remember we're saying if we had a damping ratio of 0.1 then it's going <coughs> to decrease uh, according to that graph up here like by 70 going to lose like 25 percent with each cycle on this graph and that was a damping ratio of only 0.1 and there this is about a quarter but we're not losing a quarter we're only losing like three percent in that diagram so it's got a damping ratio that's definitely less than 0.1 so that looks good although this is very low it's a double 037 so we've got to check our calcs here <clears throat> but let's see how we would go on here double o three so that's even lower than this one. Which is uh, going to give you an amplification. See, this one will give you an amplification of 10, 11, 12, 13. That's times 14 here. So we would need a, a taller graph to be able to do that one. We probably need to check our numbers, make sure we've got that one right. Maybe we should just do that one again. <clears throat> that is a bit of a tricky calc. Let's just double check we, we got that calc for it. Right. 
You're doing something tricky, you're better off doing it in Excel rather than calculator. <clears throat> okay, so we've got uh, number three. So we're getting the same number there with the decrement. That's the point oh two three. <clears throat> now we're going to go for the uh, for the other formula. So this is damping ratio. Counting up brackets here. One, two, three, two, one, zero. Okay, so that should work. Yep, still in that same number, double O, three, seven, five. So that looks like <coughs> the number. Double O, three, seven, five. <coughs> um, that looks like the damping ratio. <coughs> Alright, so what we did is we had to we have these numbers here x1 and x2. Where have they come from? They come from here. This is x1. This is an actual photograph of, of the beam oscillating. Um, superimposed on top of each other. So that's my x1. And this is my x2. <laughs> <clears throat> and that those uh, distances are just measured off the photograph itself. If you're, um, my computer's working fine here, so um, the video should come out okay. It's um, responding pretty well. <clears throat> All right, so then we take those two distances or uh, amplitudes, and we feed them into this equation first in order to find the decrement and then once we got the decrement we can put it in the other equation to find the damping ratio. Alright, the only problem is the damping ratio is off the graph because we have 003 so it's less than the 0.01. We need a graph that has a smaller <coughs> damping ratio than 0.01. Um, so there's a few questions here to, to answer. What's causing damping on the cantilever? And we do we can actually see we, we lost three about three percent uh, between two oscillations. So that's how much damping's going on. But what's causing that? Why is the cantilever slowing down? In other words, what slows the cantilever down? Well, basically friction. So think of anything that is frictional. We have friction due to what? What's causing friction? <clears throat> now, now, even if you had this inside a vacuum with no air resistance, it will still slow down. So you've got to think about that friction as well. What friction would be causing it to slow down if it was in a vacuum? Right now, air is obviously going to be a big one. So air resistance is causing it to slow down. That's one. But there's also the material itself. So the aluminium has friction in it, inside it. Not a perfect spring. It's getting hot. Every time you bend it, it gets hotter. And that's using up energy. So um, there's friction inside the metal itself. And anything else you can come up with. <clears throat>
there's this next question, uh, number three, is not going to affect us very much because their damping ratio is so small. But what it's talking about is that the the actual natural frequency of the vibrations are actually moving a little bit. See, there's the natural frequency peak there. So with, with more damping, you're bringing the natural frequency forward. So it's having a um, lower natural frequency. Doesn't have any effect though for the damping ratio we have, which is very small. Okay, determine the magnification of the driving amplitude. Yes, that's what you do with this graph. And you're trying to find, you know, what is it, times 10 or whatever. And because our ratio is less than 0.01, it might be times 20 or 30. Uh, so it's going to, it's definitely going to uh, magnify pretty significantly. <clears throat> um, that's pretty much it for that last part of the report, number seven. Find that damping ratio and then um, and try and plot it on a graph. Of course, here it's gone off the graph. Um, because we are about the below 37. We're less than half of the size of this one. So it's probably going to be something like times 20 or 30. Approximately times 20. <coughs> 30 in that ballpark. So I need a graph for um, damping ratios that are smaller than 0 0.01. Okay, that's it for question seven. And explain any deviations in will behave. So if you if you had a um, a different frequency in the experiment to the one that you get on Inventor or the one that you calculate by hand, if it's different, then sometimes the damping ratio could explain that because the damping, if there's a fair bit of damping, that's going to cause the frequency to shift a bit. The maximum frequencies will shift over here. Um, but in our case, our natural frequencies are so, sorry, our, our damping ratio is so small because we're way up here somewhere then it's going to be pretty much dead on um, the natural frequency of the object. So um, see if it is too low to shift, to cause a shift in the um, resonant frequency. And that's about it. We'll finish up there.